Welcome to the Beast Rider Podcast. I am your host, Ryan Sakamoto, and we are going to continue and talk about the breaking news on J.J. Watt going and choosing the Arizona Cardinals as his landing destination. So let's get started. This is a fun one, guys. You guys know how I feel about J.J. Watt. I did earlier podcasts on him. I thought, honestly, he would be going to the Green Bay Packers. Obviously, that didn't turn out that way. And it's funny, I put this on Twitter and I said, out of all the teams that were mentioned, and I'm just mind blown by this, how come the Arizona Cardinals weren't one of the teams that was mentioned as a front runner? You know, we hear about the Pittsburgh Steelers and the ties and connecting the dots and how the Watt brothers and the trio there would be a smart move and how he would be intrigued by playing. In Pittsburgh, and we also heard about the Buffalo Bills being in play, obviously the Cleveland Browns and the Green Bay Packers, as I just, just pointed out. But we never once heard the Arizona Cardinals as a landing destination. So it's funny to point out whenever someone gets released, like a big name, hot free agent like that, it's always the quiet ones, the ones who aren't even in discussion that that player actually goes to. And that's a credit to obviously the agent, obviously the player himself, who's not following these teams on social media like Twitter and uh, kind of connecting the dots there. So it was really interesting for me to see that J.J. Watt would be choosing the Arizona Cardinals. But is it surprising? Absolutely not. It's not surprising in the sense that I'm going to go ahead and break it down as to why the move makes sense, right? So let's go ahead and talk about that, right? Well, if you watched my earlier podcast and regards to Deshaun Watson, I always tied J.J. Watt to that blockbuster deal. And the reason for that was because, again, he was owed $17.5 million for the upcoming season, but had zero dead money tied to his contract. So if you're looking at it from GM Nick Casario's perspective, you know you're going to get an aging player coming into a new team. You kind of have to leverage the cap how you see fit. And with a decreased salary cap, it really makes logical sense to go ahead and move on from J.J. Watt and start fresh, which is why I included Brian Burns in that Panther and that Panthers in that Panthers Deshaun Watson deal. That's why I include Nick Bosa in that 49ers for Deshaun Watson deal, because not to say that those guys aren't valuable, but if you're looking at it from a logical GM perspective, especially GM Nick Casarius perspective, you're going to want something game return because nothing is guaranteed, especially when it comes to draft picks. So if you're going to get scrutinized for making the wrong pick, at least you can leverage and rationalize this deal by getting a Pro Bowl talented player in return. And that's what Bosa and Brian Burns really bring to the table. All right. But getting back to this particular podcast, and I'll include that podcast and those respective podcasts in the description below. So go ahead and hit that and you can watch those after this one. But getting back to this specific podcast, you know, he was released by the Texans and then fast forward to today, he signs a two year, $31 million contract with the Arizona Cardinals, $23 million in guaranteed. All right. Now let's talk about why he chose the Arizona Cardinals in the first place. Well, the Arizona Cardinals, to me, are a team on the rise. Like They're right there, but unfortunately, they just haven't been able to get it done. Now, J.J. Watt reunites with DeAndre Hopkins from their time in Houston Texans. And from their time with the Houston Texans, you have to wonder if DeAndre Hopkins put in some kind of a side note to Steve Kime saying, hey, let's go get this guy, man. I know what he can do. Let's just get all the good Texans players and bring him over to the Arizona Cardinals. Now, nah, but getting back to it, no, that it makes logical sense on why J.J. Watt would come to the Arizona Cardinals because he fits a need, right? So the Arizona Cardinals play in a 34 base defense, right? And when you play in a 34 base defense, odds are you need a pass rusher from the IDL, interior defensive line. When you're playing the four technique and you're two gapping, leveraging, and clipping, you still have to generate pressure up front in order to open up and free up the linebackers behind you. But more importantly than that, if you're not a one-trick pony and just being a two-gap run stuffer and you can really shoot up field and get vertical, that's going to add value to that defensive front seven. And that's what J.J. Watt brings to the table. Unfortunately, 2019 third-round pick Zach Allen is not getting it done. He was drafted in the 2019 NFL draft number 65 overall, I believe. And he's been injury prone up to this point. Now, 
that's not a knock on Zach Allen that he can't be good. But anytime you have a guy like J.J. Watt, a veteran who is a reigning defensive player of the year, and he also can rack up double-digit sacks in any given season, you have to go ahead and make that play. You have to. And when you look at the team financially and from a depth chart standpoint, you already signed Jordan Phillips from the Buffalo Bills last year, anchoring one side. Now you add J.J. Watt, who racked up 25 sacks in the last three years on the opposite side, including 11 forced fumbles. And you really have two anchors on the defensive line that you can win with moving forward because you can't double team everyone. And especially in a two gap scheme, like the Arizona Cardinals play in that 34 base defense, it's really going to help out guys like Hassan Reddick on the back end. All right. Now let's take a look at what, uh, to play devil's advocate, I would say to kind of like, this is kind of like buyer's remorse, right? When you look at JJ Watt, he does come with red flags and the red flags is mainly his injury history. He missed 32 games in the last five years, guys, 32 games in the last five years. That's either damaged goods or you're getting an all pro player. The return on investment or what's called ROI, we really don't know what that is. But kudos to Steve Kime from actually pulling the trigger, right? Because he didn't have to make this deal, but he did. And he thought he needed an upgrade at the position. And that's why he went ahead and did that. Now, which brings us to our next question, right? He signed a 30 plus million dollar contract with $23 million in guaranteed, right? 31 million, 23 guaranteed, all right? So that leaves 8 million that's not guaranteed. Well, that's a front-loaded deal, no matter how you look at it, and it's a short-term plan, two years. So you can't really backload that contract in the final year of his contract because majority of that money is probably gonna be given up front. So with that being said, there's not enough money to go around, especially with the salary cap moving down and dropping from 198.2 million to roughly $180 million due to COVID, right? And with that being said, taking a step further to peel back another layer of the onion to really get to the core, as I always like to say, Chandler Jones, I think is going to be released. Now, Steve Kime about a week ago said, I'll give you a gold nugget that Jones won't be released, but that was news before they signed J.J. Watt. And I even reported this before J.J. Watt news broke out in an earlier podcast, which you can watch in the description below. I know JP, and he's a huge Arizona Cardinals fan. I'm sure he's happy about the J.J. Watt signing, and we talked about the Chandler Jones situation as well. But I believe, ultimately, Chandler Jones is the odd man out. Why? Because the Arizona Cardinals are barely head above water as the cap currently stands. And anytime you look at a player playing in the last year of his contract who was out previously due to a torn biceps, I believe, you have to really wonder if he's going to be in your long-term plans. And if you can wipe your hands clean of this player in the last year of his contract and save the team $15.5 million in cap savings, you can kill two birds with one stone because now you're getting salary cap health, but you're also being able to retain your younger talent, mainly Hassan Reddick, who had a breakout year and is also an unrestricted free agent. So when you put the two and two together, it really makes logical sense. Now you want to peel back another layer of the onion to really get to the core. Who would you rather keep? Because the Cardinals are not one or two players away from reaching the Super Bowl. They're just not. And when you have guys and you look at the financial snap sheet and you see a guy like Robert Alford, he really hasn't done much since coming over from the Atlanta Falcons. And then you can save yourself $7.5 million there in cap savings. So you add $7.5 million plus you look at Chandler Jones, 15.5. That's a total of $23 million in cap savings just from those two moves away right? So you wipe your hands clean of those guys. You can re-sign for the foreseeable future, these younger homegrown talent. And that's how you win in today's NFL. The salary cap plays a huge role in who you retain and who you let go. You cannot keep everyone. This is not a like the pre nineties where the San Francisco 49ers can just outright buy players, right? You can't just outright buy players and win a ring. That's not how it works these days, right? There's a thing called a salary cap now. So with that, that's why I believe Chandler Jones is going to be released because, again, he was hurt last year. He's in the last year of his contract. Steve Kime even shed light on this situation that he's not sure if he's going to strike a long-term deal with them. Obviously, they're negotiating behind closed doors. But if nothing came to grips now, I don't think it will. 
I think ultimately he's going to play out, if anything, the last year of his contract and be gone. If you're Steve Kime, you're doing yourself a disservice because knowing that you want to make sure heading into the NFL draft that Chandler Jones is either there or not there. Because if he's just there for a one-year rental in the last year of his contract, now you're doing yourself a disservice because you're putting your salary cap in financial strain because now instead of wiping your hands clean of his 2021 cap number and saving the team $15.5 million in cap savings, you're basically just using him as a plug and play player, which doesn't make any logical sense whatsoever, which brings me to my next question, right? Draft flexibility, right? Let's talk about the draft flexibility. So if they were to release Chandler Jones, they already signed JJ Watt. That gives them Huge draft flexibility at what they do at number 16. Now, defensive end was a huge need for them. Obviously, there's no 3-4 defensive end worthy of that number 16 selection anyways, but it gives them some draft flexibility on what they want to do at number 16. They can either draft a cornerback like J.C. Horn, because we all know if you watch my earlier podcast, Patrick Sertan, Patrick Sertan, Patrick Peterson, and Drake Kirkpatrick are both unrestricted free agents. I don't see them coming back. I just point out that Robert Alford's not coming back, in my opinion. So that's three of your top four cornerbacks. Obviously, Byron Murphy's going to be back, but you really need someone on the other side. JC Horn would be a logical answer at pick number 16. Now, if he's off the board, you still have other options that you can go in. My draft crush, Ra- uh, Raji Harris. Oh, God, why can't I talk? Najee Harris. I'm so excited about this podcast, obviously. Najee Harris at 16 would be a great addition and an upgrade over Kenyon Drake. You can also look at a guy like Travis Etienne from Clemson. He would also be a nice pick up there. So the, there's a lot of moving parts, but at the end of the day, the Cardinals have options because J.J. Watt gives them that ability to go ahead and look at other needs, especially on the offensive side of the football. And Cliff Kingsbury being an offensive guy from Texas Tech, you really want to take that into account and say, hey, look, okay, man, you're on the hot seat, bro. We're going to do everything we can to build up your offense. The defense will take care of itself because we're signing these free agents like JJ Watt, Jordan Phillips, some of these other guys. And we want you to really focus on the offense this year because we really want Kyler Murray to develop and You promised us that you can do it, so get it done. That's what's going on in Arizona right now. So I am really excited about J.J. Watt to the Arizona Cardinals because I think he's going to bring a pass rush that hasn't been seen in a long time. I know J.P.'s happy. I know Arizona Cardinals fans are happy. They're hitting me up on my YouTube right now and also hitting me up on Twitter and saying, oh, my gosh, we got J.J. Watt, J.J. Swatt and so forth. So happy for you guys. He's going to shake up the NFC West. Now, will he be a perennial all pro player? That is ultimately going to determine again, based on the red flags that I just mentioned on whether he can sustain health, right? Whether he can be durable for a full 16 game schedule and possibly a deep playoff run. Well, that'll be it for today, or at least for this podcast, I'll be coming back on at two o'clock going live with Jerry Yang, our first live video. We are just going to shoot it and go live. Be sure to leave comments in the section below and drop those comments because as you know, when you're here in the Beast Rider family, it's where social media engagement is encouraged. Thank you for tuning in. Have a good guy. Have a good guy. Gosh, I cannot talk. It must be the coffee. Have a good day, Beast Rider. Out. <laughs>